International Studies and the Living History Program at Duke University are honored to present an interview with the Honorable Jack Matlock. Mr. Matlock, a graduate of Duke University in 1950, entered the Foreign Service in 1956 after a distinguished career in Washington, Africa, and Eastern Europe. Mr. Matlock served as an ambassador to the Soviet Union in crucial years between 1987 and 1991. He is presently George F. Kennan, Professor of History at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He will be interviewed today by uh, Warren Lerner, Professor of History at Duke University, Professor Thomas Lahusen, Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature, and myself. Uh, my name is Professor Tremo. I'm in economics, and I'm also a director of our Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies. Thank you. We'll start with general questions. And uh, Thomas, if you would lead off. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, in your review of Anatoly Dobrynin's memoir in Confidence, Moscow's Ambassador to America's Six Cold War Presidents, that you wrote in, uh, published in the New York Review of Books in February 1st, 1996, you write about Dobrynin's fundamental allegiance to the communist system. You also give him credit for his performance as a Soviet diplomat. Uh, that is, for having been able for so long, and I think I quote you here, to mislead his American interlocutors who mistook his charm and bonhomie for sympathy and understanding. My question is the following. To what extent was Dobrynin and other communist officials uh, of that kind, including Gorbachev, a believer in the system, and to what extent did he or they uh, just serve it cynically because they didn't see any viable alternative for themselves? And what is the meaning of loyalty to the communist system for those top figures of the Soviet political establishment? Those are very big questions, and I think that it's hard to give categorical answers because motivations and even loyalties tend to be somehow alloyed with other, with other emotions. But I would say I think that unlike Gorbachev, uh, Dobrynin never quite rejected the Soviet system. He, uh, and he, he was not that he was uh, that he didn't see some of the faults, uh, and uh, he was certainly at times in favor of, of compromises, say, in our relationship. Uh, but Gorbachev, who started out as a believer in the system and totally loyal to it, saw that he had to change it, and he was willing uh, to do some very basic changes, some of which was reevaluating the foreign policy bases that Dobrynin had served. Uh, and I think that for Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, uh, his foreign minister, the so-called new thinking, the rejection of the class struggle as the basis for foreign policy and the adoption of what they call the common interests of mankind, which really meant that they should take into consideration other people's interests as well as their own and to find their own in harmony with others, I think they acted on those uh, uh, those uh, convictions, uh, changed convictions. Uh, in de Brennan's case, he never changed his convictions. How much of this was simply a feeling that it was his job to serve the system, that was certainly part of it. But I think that basically he did not think the system was fundamentally unjust, and though he could criticize individual policies, like the invasion of Afghanistan, at the same time, he felt that any arrangement with the U.S. should have been based on the previous assumptions and that there should be sort of compromises rather than a change of policy. And Gorbachev and Chevronadze did it differently. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, uh, some people's career are defined by having been present at the creation. You are in the unique position of having been present at the destruction. <laughs> uh, given that premise, <laughs> I wonder if you would briefly comment on our policy towards the Gorbachev regime in the sense of could we or should we have given him uh, a different form of support than we did? We came around to supporting him, perhaps long, some people say longer than we should have, uh, but were there alternatives that if we had pursued them might have yielded some different results or was our position irrelevant? 
Well, obviously, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm probably not the most objective observer because yeah. I was part of our own policy formation. And yeah. uh, I, I believe that up until, say, the f late summer or fall of 1990, yeah. I believe we did as much as we could have. Yeah. Now, I think in that, at that time, about the time they were talking about the 500-day plan, uh, and uh, that we could have done more if we had been willing to engage more on how they should go about the economic reform. Gorbachev was casting about, he was, uh, and he was um, clearly signaling that he would like advice as well as support. In fact, he was talking more about advice then. We really didn't have our act together to give him consistent advice, and maybe we couldn't have. So I don't want to say that this would have changed things greatly necessarily. But it does seem to me that if we had been willing at that time to weigh in with a proposal to, say, organize some sort of revised OSCD, uh, uh, an economic organization that would include his people and ours, to try to, say, to give advice and steer them to a market economy, that probably would have been acceptable and maybe it would have saved some of the problems later. But up until that point, I, I don't buy the argument that we were too hard on Gorbachev. I think, first of all, Gorbachev himself had an evolving position, and there was no reason for us to assume, say, in 1985 or 1986, that he was going to proceed as, in fact, he did. He made his own decision for, uh, to go toward political reform only in 1987. I think we recognized that when he made it clear by 1988. But it was not at all clear to us that the best way to help him would be to compromise some of the positions. At, we were not asking them to do anything that was not in their interest if they were to be a peaceful country. And uh, for example, simply to cut the difference in our arms control proposals would have made no sense at all, from their point of view or from ours. And to keep the pressure on him to democratize, uh, to uh, observe human rights, uh, to lower the numbers, uh, despite the fact he was getting opposition from the military, um, th those, I think, were valid policies and were uh, not against their interests. So that I think our, our pressure on him helped him do what he should have been doing anyway, but might have had trouble doing. Uh, Jack, you know, I think that you are unique among American ambassadors to Moscow in the sense that you have visited most republics and repeatedly. Mm -hmm. You had a much better picture of regional problems, frictions, and so on. So I have two questions. One is, were you aware of the explosion to take place uh, in 1991? And did you advise, did you talk to State Department, to the National Security Council? Because my impression was that the West was not prepared for the regional Republican uh, disintegration of the country. I think we were, in the embassy, I think we were very much abreast of what was happening. Uh, we obviously couldn't predict that on a given date specific things were going to happen any more than we know what the Dow Jones is going to close today, precisely. Uh, I mean, uh, you can't predict certain things. Uh, I sent my first message to Washington saying that we should adjust our policy to take account of the fact that the Soviet Union might collapse in June 1990, that is 18 months before it happened. Uh, that assessment was, not, was neither rejected nor overwhelmingly accepted. Uh, the CIA sent it out to our largest embassies, eyes only for the ambassador, with the comment, you will be interested in Ambassador Matlock's views. They didn't say I was right, I was wrong, but the fact that they circulated it meant that uh, obviously it was something that uh, they wanted at least a few select people to be aware of. Um, so that I, we were already in the embassy thinking about making sure we had contingency plans uh, to deal uh, with a situation uh, of, of, con you know, of, of increasing fragmentation to the point of collapse. And I think the individual uh, republics, I, I was incredibly, I think, lucky that I had a very good staff. We had people who were assigned to each of these republics. We kept uh, 
We kept two diplomatic officers in every one of the Baltic capitals continuously, though we had no office there. They stayed in hotels. Uh, and uh, all three of the Baltic capitals, we had somebody almost continuously in the others uh, who knew the people there. So it wasn't just my own travel. Uh, I, had, uh, I had an Uzbek speaker on the staff. We had Armenian speakers on the staff. Uh, and actually, the Republic, the nationalist leaders knew us, and they would actually, by 1990 and 91, if they had some news, they'd pick up the phone and call the embassy. Usually not me, but usually the officer who dealt with it. So I think we were, uh, we, we did have the pulse of what was going on. What we couldn't, of course, uh, anticipate was the precise form it would take. Now, clearly, Gorbachev was going to have to move faster, both on structural reforms in the economy, uh, which was part of this, and also in somehow accommodating these nationalist pressures. And, and they were tied in many republics with these two things. Um, and whether he would, could successfully do so, we really couldn't predict. Um, and it seemed in 91, after he came to the agreement at uh, uh, Nova Agaryova uh, with uh, at nine of the of the republic uh, presidents that he just might pull it off. Uh, we thought it was entirely possible uh, that he could have eight or nine republics in a union treaty. By, by the spring of 91, it was clear the Balts wouldn't be there, Moldova wouldn't be there, and some of the Transcaucasian republics, certainly Georgia, wouldn't be there. But uh, the others, it was still possible, I think, then. Uh, uh, we knew that there were plenty of people in the party and in the military in KGB that did not like the way things were going and were likely to conspire. But we also knew that they had sort of called it off each time when they had a conspiracy going before it reached its head. So although the coup attempt in August in a certain sense was not a surprise, in the other sense it was because uh, you know, the assumption was that they may keep calling it off and then the time will pass when it will no longer work. And in fact, the time had passed that it would work uh, when they tried it. So it was not that we were unaware. It was just that uh, you could not predict how individuals were going to react in the future. And when we look back at that coup, we know now that they didn't know what they were going to do until late the, uh, the night of the 18th of August that they would announce in the wee hours of the morning of the 19th that they were taking over uh, because they had still hoped that they would convince Gorbachev to, in effect, authorize a crackdown. And it was when he didn't. But that's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, if they didn't themselves know what they were going to do, how in the world could others? Uh, I think what we did know then, and uh, uh, I had conveyed this pretty clearly and even told the press this in response to a question before I left in August, uh, 91, that if there was an attempted coup, it would likely fail. Because I, it, our assessment was things had reached the point that a coup attempt uh, would not be successful if it was tried. Uh, and it turned out that that assessment was correct. So it was a fast-moving situation, but I think when historians study the documents, they will conclude that we were, we were probably had a better understanding than the KGB itself and Gorbachev himself and not because we had better intelligence, simply because we had better contacts and perhaps we were looking at it more objectively. Jack, I have a related question. Uh, you know, a number of Russians believe, and I talk to them when I visit Moscow, believe that there was some sort of a Western conspiracy uh, headed by secret services, intelligence services, uh, to uh, promote disintegration of the Soviet Union. The West wants Russia to be weak, and, uh, of course, there's some historical evidence that this did take place in 1917 or around the revolution time. Uh, you deny this in your book, uh, and I think that many people in the West would agree with you. But would you expand? I mean, you're, actually, your denial is fairly short. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you know of these conspiracy theories. Yes. And so on. What's, uh, what's your reaction to this? Happening? Well, I, it is nonsense. There's no basis for it whatsoever. You're right that these theories are banded about. I, you know, I, I called on Gorbachev last week. I was in Moscow, and uh, one of the things he said to me, he said, you know, the people get some of the craziest ideas. He said, during my campaign last year, a lady correspondent came up to me in Petersburg 
and uh, asked me, uh, are you still working for the CIA? And he said, uh, I looked straight at her and I said, yes. And she said, why are you doing it? And he, and he said, because they pay me well. And he said, you know, they actually put this on uh, television, but it was also absurd that he thought most people, you know, understood that, uh, uh, the joke. Uh, I'm not sure they do. There are always people in all countries that uh, go for conspiracy theories. And, of course, the Russians, having lived in a society which before uh, the communists, and certainly during the communist regime, most decisions were taken in a conspiratorial fashion. After all, the Communist Party operated like a, uh, like a criminal uh, organization in many ways. Uh, conspiracy theories, uh, theories are particularly attractive. The fact is, we had no uh, sort of direct action activities directed at breaking them up. You know, the passions were such that if we had followed that role, we could have encouraged violence all over the place. Uh, uh, we could have maybe even tipped off a Yugoslav scale sort of thing. We didn't want that. It was very clear we didn't want that. And I think that uh, uh, these accusations were made at the time largely for entirely political reasons. Khrushchev began making speeches in December 90 uh, referring to secret services and I actually went to him in January and said, look, you know very well that's not true. And uh, actually, he, he had every means of knowing. We found out later he had Ames sitting in headquarters telling him everything. But they, they knew we didn't, that is, their specialists knew that we really didn't have anything of that sort. We were not trying to break them up. Uh, we said all along the Baltic states should be free. We also, uh, also told them that, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> we would love for them to have a, a voluntary union. Uh, the Union Treaty uh, that Gorbachev, but the, uh, and that we made it very clear in public, we would prefer dealing with one government on the basis of a voluntary union. Uh, Bush made that very clear uh, August 1st in Kiev, 1991, in what Bill Sapphire has called his Chicken Kiev speech. Actually, I think in retrospect it will be read pretty well because what he said there was freedom and independence are not synonymous. Choose freedom. First, uh, and you know, implicitly, you can always get independence later if you want to, but don't sell your freedom for some formal independence, and that, in effect, is what Ukrainians did, uh, you know, in, in a certain sense. But uh, no, we didn't try to break them up. We didn't particularly want to break them up. We did want them to democratize. We did want them to have a more responsive government because we thought, if the people were, to use the modern term, empowered, uh, they would say, control the aggressive tendencies of the government. They weren't going to voluntarily vote to put 25 percent of their GNP into the military, for example, uh, so that we were for democratization, for opening up, uh, but we didn't go for, uh, for the dismantling. And of course, we are not trying to keep Russia weak. That's another charge. I tell people, if we wanted to keep Russia weak, why would we use so much of our dip diplomatic pressure on Ukraine to have them return all of their nuclear weapons to Russia? And of course, uh, we did the same in Belarus and Kazakhstan, though they didn't require the same persuasion. Obviously, we have tried to help Russia to the mar in the marginal ways we can uh, to develop their strength. But these, uh, these conspiracy theories, I think, are not only the result of people who like to look for, for conspiracies, and people who, like Kuchkov, the head of the KGB, who himself is, uh, to a great extent, responsible for some of the events that brought the Soviet Union down. Uh, so it's self-exculpating, in a sense. But it's also, I think, a reflection of the fact that people rather blame others than themselves uh, for their problems. And, and you certainly get that element, too. Yes, yeah, so a, a while ago, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you used the word uh, criminal organization uh, yes. concerning the, the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and I think you, you also wrote this in, in one of your views. Yes. Uh, when, uh, at the same time, you were dealing uh, with, uh, with the state and also the party to a certain extent, right? Because there is, where is the limit? And when, when according to you, uh, because you have a long experience and a quite a extensive knowledge on, on Soviet history, when did this, uh, when did the party really become, in your eyes, a criminal organization? Well, I think from its very inception of the Bolshevik party. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and because, you know, if, 
and I think it is a fact, as I understand them, that Stalin, Lenin, and others had a lot of contacts with the thieves in the law, as they call them, mm -hmm. the, uh, the professional criminals during their uh, Siberian exiles. They were very impressed with sort of the modus operandi, the vow of silence, the absolute loyalty, uh, the, uh, you know, you operate by your own codes, not by the formal law. And I think that in organizing the Bolshevik party, many of these things were there. So many were there from the very beginning. Uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, much of the sensitive party things were considered party confidential. Uh, and, uh, it, and, and the vow of silence was very similar to the Sicilian Mafia, if you read about that organization. So that this was a conspiratorial, uh, organization essentially outside the law, even outside the law they themselves created. Now, I'm not saying by that that, uh, that all the people in the Communist Party were criminals. No, obviously they were op operating in at least a pseudo-legal fashion, but they were operating outside the formal legal structure. And when a party secretary would pick up the phone and call a judge or call a plant manager and order them to do things, this is the way, uh, this is what I mean by criminal procedures. So um, I think that these habits were deeply entrenched in the Soviet way of doing things. And I think it's one of the reasons that today there's such great problem getting away from it. And what has happened uh, in a sense is that a country run by one single criminal organization is now to a large extent run by a multiplicity of them, some of them spinoffs from the old one because a large number of the current organized crime figures come right out of the Communist Party. And I think that's no accident. So uh, that's really what I meant. And I don't mean to condemn the individuals. Actually, the individuals, this was the only way to political power. And you have to hand it to people like Gorbachev and Shevardnadze and, and Yakovlev and some of the others, is that they clearly at one had enough, I would say, morality left and, and sense that when they began to see these things clearly, and it took them a while, they were willing to try to change it. And uh, so I, uh, I don't condemn the individualists at all, except that the organization, I, I would, uh, uh, the whole way the, the Communist Party ruled the country was, except for this Article 6, which somehow <laughs> supposedly legitimized it, an illegal way of doing it, because it was outside the formal you know, processes of administration and, and justice. To switch gears for a moment, if I may, um, in a trip to East Europe in 1995, I was surprised talking with people in Poland and Hungary in particular, uh, not at the uh, anti-Russian, anti-communist sentiments, they were expected, but it was pointed out to me several times that one of the good things of the changes were they no longer had a border with Russia, except for the Kaliningrad outpost, which mm -hmm apparently people weren't that worried about. And it seemed almost, in Poland, particularly a sense of relief, we don't have Russia at our door anymore. Now, with the possible merging of Belarus and Russia, uh, that might change. Is it possible, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much Yeltsin himself wants to merge, but that's a separate issue. Is it possible that if this merger does go through, the Soviet uh, strategic interests in East Europe will change and perhaps be uh, slightly more aggressive even. I don't think so. Yeah. One thing, I think if the merger occurs, yeah. it is going to be a very, very difficult one for Russia. Yeah. Uh, it's very clear that Lukashenko, the uh, Belarusian leader who was elected, uh, uh, which I guess tells you something about the political sophistication of the people in Belarus, <laughs> Uh, he, he is trying to maintain the old system, and he wants union with Russia for the subsidies that will keep a centralized, uh, subsidized industrial and agricultural system. He wants uh, Russia to buy from them products of the military-industrial complex, which is very uh, you know, significant in Belarus. They're not going to do that. I mean, they can't do that very much, and that's why I think most of the reformers are absolutely against this union. Uh, Yeltsin has gone along with it verbally because he doesn't want to be accused by the nationalists of selling out uh, Russian interests. And also, I think he doesn't want to be accused of acting against Russian interests when he led the breakup of the Soviet Union. And, uh, but 
Uh, but what we are getting, every time you look at these declarations and these agreements, they have no substance. I mean, they'll say we, we're unified, and yet we keep our sovereignty, we keep the separate ones. And uh, I think a statement was made even after the uh, latest agreement uh, last week that was signed uh, that, well, you know, it's a long time before we'll have a common currency and, and certain other things. Uh, so Russia really can't afford to absorb them now, and I think what Russia is telling Lukashenko uh, not very loudly in the press is, you know, you got to start reforming your economy before uh, our, uh, our countries are really compatible for a true integration. I think there has always been an, an integration of, of the military in the sense that I'm sure the Russians would have defended the Belarusian border to the west. I don't believe these current uh, uh, shenanigans, and that's really what they are, uh, change the geopolitical situation in the slightest. They almost just prove the point that uh, Russia really can't afford an empire anymore, and if, uh, even if Lukashenko wants to bring them in as, a, in effect, a colony, uh, the Russians are probably, probably going to have enough sense not to accept that. Uh, Jack, you know, there's a number of people uh, maintain that President Reagan actually changed the basic policy towards Russia from the containment, which was advocated by George Kennan way back in 1948, uh, that um, President Reagan was the first American president who actively wanted to oppose to, in fact, declare maybe economic warfare uh, on the Soviet empire as a whole and uh, actively supported Solidarność in, in, in Poland, actively supported uh, the Afghan rebels, uh, probably forced the oil price down to hurt the uh, hard currency earnings. Um, you know, there's a whole books written on this. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you refer to some, of, some aspects of this in your book, but never as if this whole program existed or not. What's your position? I think this? most of these claims are exaggerated. Uh, first of all, I, I don't believe Reagan ever really adopted the view, although there were people in his administration that did, uh, that this was a matter of sort of all-out uh, warfare with the Soviet Union and that we were out uh, for their destruction. That was not part of his thinking. He felt when he came to office that we were too weak to negotiate effectively. And he looked at our defense buildup and some of these other things, such as bringing pressure to bear on them, which he agreed with, as putting us in a better negotiating position. His goal all along in his mind, though he had not thought it through in any detail, uh, was that uh, he wanted to negotiate a grand deal. And as of I was brought on the uh, NSC staff in 19... Um, 83 with the precise assignment that this is what the president wants to do but he you know none of us know how to do it they had a staff then that didn't really know the country very well and uh, I you know I was considered one of the most senior of the foreign service officers with long experience there and they brought me on the staff and they said your job is to develop a negotiating plan and now that now that he feels he has enough strength enough chips on the poker table so to speak but uh, I, and we briefed him and, uh, and, and developed these plans, which combined strength and pressure on them. The pressure was there with a willingness to negotiate. And we made a special effort to define our goals in ways that would not undermine their national interests, so long as they defined their national interest in a non-aggressive way. In other words, we were really were not trying to bring them down. We were trying to change them. And we thought we had to bring the pressure to bear on them, number one, to make it clear how much their economy was failing in terms of the rest of the world, to convince them they could not sustain an arms race, because unless we convinced them of that, we knew the military would, would meet everything we did with demands for more. But we did have the insight to know if they did that, they would reach a point where the political authorities could no longer do it. And they would say, now, wait a minute. They're running circles around us, uh, seem to be, you know, without even breathing hard. Uh, we, you know, we've already given you so much. We cannot continue this race. So, yes, we brought pressure to bear, but it was pressure to convince them to end the arms race on terms that we would find acceptable. And in Reagan's mind, that meant deep cuts. From the very beginning and, and throughout his career, he was utterly convinced that nuclear weapons are immoral, 
that they can never be used, they never should be used, and eventually they should be abolished. And he wanted to be known as the president that would move us in that direction. That's why he became so enamored of SDI, for example, because he saw that as the solution that would allow us to eliminate nuclear weapons. So he didn't want arms control. He wanted arms reduction. Uh, and, uh, you know, then he left it essentially up to the rest of us to tell him how to do it. Um, when he went into the first summit in Geneva, and he had wanted a summit earlier, but as he said publicly at that time, when he was accused during the campaign of not having a summit, he said, well, you know, they keep dying on me. And uh, in fact, that was a problem uh, w with an infirm Andropov, uh, an incompetent and infirm uh, Chernyenko. And so until we got Gorbachev, uh, there wasn't really anybody uh, that he could meet with. But going into that, I have a memo, uh, which was not classified, but just given to me personally, that he dictated going to Geneva which makes it very clear he was aiming for almost a ceasefire in place. We did want to stop the competition in, in, third, uh, in these third world areas. Um, we, uh, we had not started the opposition in Afghanistan. Uh, we stepped it up, you know, the, uh, uh, the armed supplies, and we, we started giving them stingers, which was particularly effective uh, against the uh, Soviet aircraft. But uh, um, the Carter administration had already started uh, support uh, for some of these things uh, even before Reagan came to office. So that, uh, yes, he was in favor of the pressure, but the ob objective was to come to terms and to come to terms that would, uh, would preclude there being a threat to the U.S. or its allies. Yeah, Mr. Ambassador, this is sort of a related question concerning uh, um, well, before coming to, 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 to this meeting, I plunged myself again into journals and uh, newspapers of uh, Perestroika and Glasnost era. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was quite impressed by what I was reading about uh, what newspapers called the popular uh, diplomacy, that is, uh, visit between the U.S. and, uh, and the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, visits of uh, businessmen, of artists, uh, writers, and so on. So my question is, were there concerted efforts from the side of the embassy and the State Department to enhance this popular diplomacy, oh, to channel it, and maybe to contain it? Uh, not to contain it, and not even to channel it. Yeah. Uh, we, we couldn't do that. I mean, uh, that, that would be silly to think we could channel things that the American public does, mm -hmm. uh, or, or even more to contain it. Uh, we, we tried to encourage it, and as a matter of fact, uh, Reagan gave a major speech, which went largely unnoticed, uh, in. Uh, the late spring of uh, 84, where he called for a great expansion of contacts exchanges. He talked about that in his uh, speech of January 1684. Also, this little story of the cu couples that get together, which he wrote himself, by the way. He, was, uh, he believed very strongly that, you know, you've got to create more contacts between peoples. He was a true believer in that, and, and uh, then at Geneva, at the first summit with Gorbachev, we made a major proposal to them at that time uh, uh, for greatly expanded exchanges in every field, in information, uh, in educational exchanges. We made a big push for young people, high school age children, uh, exchanges. Up until then, they had not allowed very much in the way of undergraduate exchanges and nothing in the way of, of the younger and Gorbachev immediately bought this in principle, and to our amazement, within the next two years, we have been able to put in place a number of, uh, of, uh, of such exchanges with high school students living in families and so on. So this was across the board. We put a lot of effort into that. Uh, we joined it with our own efforts. I mean, when we, you know, whenever we had anything major, uh, I mean, if we had the first group of high school students, I mean, they would have a reception at Spasso House. We would introduce them, and they would be received by senior people there. We tried to give them high visibility. Every uh, art exhibit or symphony orchestra, I mean, we, there would be major efforts to, uh, you know, to, to, put, uh, to help them. So, yes, we did everything we could to make it possible, to encourage it. There was no way we could channel it and certainly not control it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may, just, just, just follow up on this. Uh, I know that you have been studying Russian literature, and I think you started yes, uh, here actually at Duke, right? Yes, right. Uh, with, mm -hmm. with Tom Winner, right? Yeah, right. That's absolutely uh, right. So I, I'm curious, uh, because we're talking a lot about, oh, about high politics and what happened, but uh, you also uh, know, uh, know that you know Russian culture and Russian literature. Uh, so 
you, you talk quite a lot about contacts you had, and not just contacts with uh, top politicians. I think you also had these other contacts that were very important in the republics and in, in the provinces. Yes. What kind of contacts were they? I mean, what, were the, was this basically the intelligentsia, or did you, uh, did you search for other well, types of Well, most were intelligentsia mm -hmm. or officials. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to go as broad as possible. Of course, we tried to talk to everybody, but it's true everywhere you don't you know you don't normally have a lot of, of taxi drivers or guys from the assembly line coming to embassy receptions i mean this is right. true in every society we would have trade union leaders once they had free trade unions mm -hmm. uh, uh but um you know traveling obviously we would talk to everybody and you could have fascinating conversations with the taxi driver or uh once we had pretty free access to plants uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you can stop and, and, and talk for a while, and by 89, and so people were getting pretty frank. They'd tell you, you know, things are lousy here, and we haven't had any meat in the stores, and often the director would be standing there and say, well, now, and sort of signaling to them, and they'd say, no, Ivan, <laughs> Ivanich, you know, <laughs> you know that's true. Why shouldn't we tell him? So it wasn't that we had no contact, and I'd say particularly the younger officers uh, often knew a lot of students, graduate students, and so on. So as an embassy, uh, though clearly we saw a lot more of intellectuals and, uh, and officials uh, than we did of others, it wasn't that we, were, uh, that we didn't have any contact. I had one officer who, uh, Russian-speaking, uh, all of our officers were Russian-speaking, but she was particularly good because she came from a Russian family. Uh, and she would stand in lines while people were waiting for things and just listen and talk to people. And she wrote some fascinating reports as the election was coming up of how the women, there were mainly women standing in the lines, their attitude toward Yeltsin and so on. And a lot of this was uh, sometime. Uh, she also had excellent contacts in the Russian Orthodox Church. She gave us a blow-by-blow blow on all things that happened when they elected a new patriarch. I mean, it was incredible. And this was just simply knowing the right people. This isn't spying or anything. So I think that we, we had good contacts in the society. Uh, and very broad, and of course uh, we were particularly uh, tried to make good contacts with, uh, also with the non-Russian republics, and to follow what was there. So it was, as they began to open up, it was almost open sesame. Uh, there were very few people that didn't associate with us. We even got to know many of the military officers uh, pretty well, those at least stationed in Moscow, and I would call on, by 90 and 91, I would usually call on military commands officially, uh, as I traveled around the country, places like Khabarovsk and so on, and, and uh, usually these contacts were rather formal. I addressed uh, three different military academies uh, and, uh, at various times, so we really tried to keep our fingers on society as a whole to the degree you can. Going back to December 1990, which you may or may not remember, you came and visited my class and gave uh, a very interesting yes. talk, and one of the students asked you about the relations between Yeltsin and Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. At the time, you indicated th there weren't any uh, to speak of. And a matter of fact, that Gorbachev would even ask you what Yeltsin was doing these days. And ruminating that afterwards, I began to wonder that surely by December 1990 that Yeltsin had given up on the Soviet Union. And I'm just wondering if there is a moment in time when Yeltsin may or may not have been planning for a future Russia without the Soviet Union. If there is such a moment, when would it have been? I'm not sure yeah. that you can name a moment. I think it sort of crept up on everybody. Uh, my own judgment was that when he was elected to the parliament in 89, he still was aiming to cooperate with Gorbachev. I think also he did not join those who opposed the creation of a presidency in early 90. And I think the reason he didn't, one of the reasons was he was still thinking that he could <laughs> succeed him as president of the Soviet Union. I think when Gorbachev continued sort of not to, to refuse to bring him on the team in any real sense, and particularly after that fiasco over the 500-day plan, when <clears throat> they had jointly named a committee which came up with a plan which Yeltsin liked, and Gorbachev reneged on it. <clears throat> it seems to me at that point, he, he, in fact, he said, in, in the case of this plan, Russia is going to implement it. Well, now, they couldn't and they didn't. But maybe that was the point. Because from then on, 
I think there were fewer efforts on his part to cooperate and much more to bring pressure to bear. And of course Gorbachev's turn to the right in the November and December of 90 <coughs> offended most of the Democrats and had them rushing over to Yeltsin. Yeltsin had his base of power then in the RSFSR parliament. And I think it was at that point he saw his chance. Now if I could get elected president of Russia, I would be an elected president, whereas Gorbachev you know, bypassed an election, got himself elected by the Congress of People's Deputies and not by the people. And I think he saw the possibility. And then when Gorbachev and others insisted upon this crazy referendum on the Union, uh, I think uh, Yeltsin pulled a bit of jujitsu. He says, okay, we'll do the referendum on that. We'll also in Russia have a referendum on a presidency because his own legislature was balking at establishing a presidency in Russia. <coughs> but he was able to use that referendum to get a vote in favor of the presidency and then of course he later won the presidency in June, became president of Russia and this put him in a position that he could eliminate, if he eliminated the Soviet Union, he eliminated Gorbachev and I think that was, was in uh, 91. Now I think in his own mind he still, though, had not rejected the idea of some sort of union treaty, provided it would give the republics, and Russia specifically, I would say most of the power. It would have been more a confederation than a real federation. So I think it was only later that he decided that he would dump Gorbachev and the Soviet Union altogether. It was impolitic then actually until Ukraine decided to leave the Union for a Russian to say they wanted to break up the Soviet Union. And he kept saying they wouldn't, of course, right up to the end of November 1991. But it was also clear once Ukraine was clearly leaving that Russia was going to be left with Central Asia and Belarus and most of the people around Yeltsin thought that would be a disaster. And they wanted it because he would not only have to deal with still some sort of Union government, with a Gorbachev who was dithering and, uh, and, and seemed to be blocking reforms, uh, and, uh, but he would, they would also have these republics that were really a drain on Russia. Uh, and therefore, I think he was convinced that it was in Russia's interest to slough them off. If Ukraine had been willing to stay in, it would have been different. And I think that the Ukrainian decision was an important one here. Professor Lerner had to excuse himself. He has a class to meet. But of course, we will continue our interview with uh, Honorable Jack Matlock, the ambassador, uh, American ambassador to, uh, to the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Jack, my question is the following. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think your book is one of the best available. And this is not just my opinion, but a number of Duke students who have read it. Are, you know, it's well written, it's comprehensive. Uh, it gives a lot of new insights, and I think it will remain in our bookshelves for, for years to come. I'm puzzled by one thing, uh, almost complete absence of any references to CIA. You know, your excellent index, uh, many pages long, doesn't even list CIA. You refer to Bob Gates once in a while, or I think once you refer to Bill Casey. Uh, but. CIA was a major player, of course, in the international scene. I realize there's always a bit of tension between diplomacy or the State Department and, and the CIA, but still, um, it's sort of, it's strange, the total absence of any reference to CIA um, is a bit puzzling. Well, first of all, I, was, uh, I intended this book to be about what happened to the Soviet Union. It was not uh, American policy was not central, nor was, say, the operation of the American embassy. Uh, obviously, I talk about that, but only to the degree I felt it was relevant. CIA, I think, was not relevant to the Soviet collapse. That's what the book is about. Uh, and uh, that, that's sort of number one. Um, in number two, I did write the book entirely on an unclassified basis. Uh, I didn't want to go back and uh, have to you know, read documents and then have them cleared. Uh, I thought I could tell this story and tell it in detail and accurately without uh, classified documents. I would simply say that uh, to my knowledge, and I think my knowledge is complete, the CIA had no operations designed to bring the Soviet Union down. In that sense, they were irrelevant. Second, uh, they, for intelligence about the political and economic 
things that we're talking about here, their analysis was essentially based upon what we reported from the embassy. I mean, at times we disagreed. Uh, sometimes uh, we were earlier than they predicting that the Soviets would leave Afghanistan, for example. But then we should have been more on top of it. We're sitting there. So the CIA analyses, I felt, uh, you know, uh, many of these have been declassified, but they were really not central to the story that I was telling. Uh, and I did try to explain how the embassy viewed it. And I think on the whole, most of these things were accepted by analysts in the CIA. So I would, I would simply say I don't think the CIA played that much role in this whole process. Uh, in that sense, that's probably why they were left out. It wasn't a calculated thing. I do talk about some of the impacts of the, uh, of the whole spying affair in, in 1986. Uh, and, uh, you know, the impact on the embassy of that, uh, because that had an impact on Summitry and on our relations, the rest of Danilov. I did tell about also some of my conversations with Kuchkov, the KGB chairman, um, because I thought he was making unfounded accusations. And uh, I wanted him to know that we knew <laughs> uh, that uh, he was. But, um, no, I, I, I really think that explains it. It wasn't a reticence. Um, that, but I, I think actually, uh, in this particular story, the CAA did not play a very important role one way or the other. Yeah, I have uh, the question about uh, about uh, Edward Shevardnadze. Uh, remember that yes. in uh, 1990, <coughs> excuse me, his departure was, uh, I mean, had some um, provoked some comments, some alarmist comments in the American press. Remember well. Yes. Uh, could you give a comment on this, and how would you? Comment on, on on this on this man and his subsequent career, uh, which is quite astonishing. Well, I think he is one of the giants of the 20th century diplomacy, and when you look back uh, on his career and his input, you might say, into the end of the Cold War, I think we can see that it was absolutely crucial. He was, for example, the one who took the brunt of introducing respect for human rights into the Soviet system. Gorbachev at first was not eager to do this. Uh, he was really pushed by Shevardnadze. Of course, Gorbachev eventually approved it, but it was the foreign ministry that set up monitoring offices in response to our request that began to twist the arms of the KGB and others and to get people released uh, to argue in favor of letting Sakharov come back. And uh, that was absolutely crucial. That's number one. Number two, he at times would go beyond uh, Gorbachev and in fact forced Gorbachev to endorse some of the things he did. He, uh, he for example, uh, delinked uh, the uh, space uh, uh, weapons uh, from uh, START, the strategic arms weapons. Uh, and it's not clear to me how much advance approval he had for Gorbachev. Gorbachev eventually accepted it. He, um, he also uh, clearly and uh, this is documented, uh, agreed to oppose the uh, uh, Iraqi aggression in Kuwait. Uh, he signed an agreement with Baker at the airport uh, uh, at Vanukova uh, on, I believe it was the 3rd or 4th of August uh, 1990, without referring it to Gorbachev, and in effect telling Gorbachev that's what needed to be done. Now, Gorbachev stayed with that policy, uh, but with some reluctance, and I wonder if, uh, if we'd had a different foreign minister, it may have been quite different because all of the Middle East professionals in the Soviet foreign ministry were advising him not to do that. Iraq was an ally and they, they shouldn't pull the rug out from under Iraq. Um, you know, he was a very moral man. He turned out to be, maybe not for his whole career. He himself says that he had to learn a lot, he had to change a lot from the time he was party secretary in Georgia. But his comments, and uh, this is documented by uh, some of his staff, at the time was when the specialists said they should stick with Iraq. He said, look, if your friend killed somebody else, can that be your, you know, your friend? Can that be an excuse for not bringing him to court? He said, no. You know, this is aggression. We've got to oppose it. And you know, so it wasn't, for him, it wasn't just the matter that he needed the United States, the Soviet Union did. For Gorbachev, that was the main matter. For him, there was also a moral question, which he understood. Now, he resigned. Of course, it was a blow, because one wasn't sure what it meant for Soviet foreign policy. He told me at the time, and I was as shocked as others, uh, though he had signaled to me earlier that he might resign. He had told me in March that 
uh, just privately, we were talking about Lithuania, but he said, look, you know, if there's going to be a crackdown, I'm going to resign because I don't want to be part of a government with blood on its hands. Um, and then this was March. Then in December, he suddenly resigned. And what I saw, I said, well, he must know something is coming. And indeed, I think it was partly that uh, and largely that that caused him to resign to give a signal sort of internally that we're going the wrong way now. And he was thinking of the internal suppression. But he also said, and this is what I started to say, he said, look, I wouldn't have done it if I had not been absolutely convinced that Gorbachev will continue the policy we set toward the United States. And in fact, by naming Bismarck as his successor, who was uh, the, and then the ambassador to the United States, whom we knew well, we had a lot of confidence in Bismarck. So if Shevardnadze had to go, this was the best way for Gorbachev to signal that he wasn't changing his foreign policy toward us. So I think we were quickly reassured on that point. What was more disturbing was the implications for Soviet internal policy, because if he had lost faith in Gorbachev's ability to, or willingness to control the situation, this was serious indeed, and in fact it turned out to be. Yeah, uh, you know, both Reagan and Gorbachev refer to the sort of uh, technological challenge of the U.S., particularly in the military field, to the Soviet Union. The whole issue of the defense burden, um, uh, what was your take on the internal Soviet perception of it? Were they bothered by it? Were they aware of the fact that it was excessive in terms relative to the rest of the world? Oh, you mean the U.S. defense budget? Uh, no, the Soviet defense budget. Soviet, Soviet defense, defense burden. We thought that that burden was clearly excessive and that the, the way they handled it structurally meant that they probably had no way of measuring what the burden was. Uh, you know, there's a, a story which I don't believe is apocryphal, uh, that uh, at his first dinner in the White House, um, when he came in 87, uh, they seated uh, Richard Pipes at the same table with Gorbachev. And at one point, Pipes turned to him and said, Mr. General Secretary, tell me, what is your defense budget, your real defense budget? And Gorbachev is said to have uh, told uh, uh, Pipes, uh, Professor Pipes, as soon as I find out, I'll make sure it's announced so you'll know too. Well, you know, by that time they had realized that these figures they were using were, you know, the budget and so on was really meaningless in terms of the burden on the economy. So w there were several things that we assumed. Number one, they didn't know how great the burden was, but they were aware that it was great. Number two, the public had no real sense of this. And that the more, if they did open up and this began to be debated, they would come under great political pressure to do something about it. Number three, that if we confronted them, that if they weren't willing to reduce uh, in a significant way, that we would continue to ratchet it up with SDI and other things, that the politicians who could understand this would have a perfect comeback to the generals who would say, we don't want to give these things up, to say, well, you got to. Otherwise, they will put us in an even worse position because we cannot fund uh, you anymore uh, to compete. And, uh, and, I, and then I think they began to look at the real, some of the real issues. For example, INF. It was actually in their interest to go to zero for these intermediate range missiles because once we had missiles in Europe, we could use them to hit the Soviet Union, but the Soviet intermediate range missiles could not hit us. Maybe Alaska from uh, f from certain parts, but basically they couldn't hit the United States. So zero favored them strategically. They should have seen that before, but until we showed our determination to deploy, uh, they were unable to, uh, to convince the military to do anything more than maybe put a ceiling on what they would do. But I think once they were confronted with this dilemma that they couldn't keep up anymore, it was already ruining them, and if they were going to reform, they had to find a way to cut military spending and, uh, and not, you know, to ratchet it up, I think this helped, you might say, concentrate the mind on what solutions might be. And it did have that effect, uh, SDI and the other aspects. Uh, there were uh, specific aspects also uh, to this buildup. We, uh, frankly, for many people, SDI was something that probably wasn't going to work in the way Reagan wanted it to, but they thought of it as something of a scam. How are you going to convince the generals to give up 50% of their heavy missiles? These are the ones we considered most threatening because we didn't have anything comparable to give up, and they usually required us to give up something. We said, okay, 
we'll tell them we'll make them obsolete. You, you know, you just, you know, we'll go ahead and you can't use the damn things. Well, it turned out uh, that now, as uh, some of the Russian negotiators will tell you, that's what they, in fact, did use to convince the generals to go along with the 50 percent cut. They're saying, look, we cannot finance an SDI. You can't have that. That's not a reaction. Why can't you give up 50 percent and, you know, uh, uh, of them because uh, we can't use these things anyway? And eventually, so I think that our policies did, in many ways, help them not only understand what they had to do, but within their own bureaucratic system, convince people that they had to do it. Yeah, I have a question, sort of a larger question again uh, on, um, well, it is not just the autopsy of, of the Soviet empire. It was also, I mean, I think an autopsy, uh, what we're doing in a way, of a whole empire, much beyond it. Mm -hmm. uh, what were your reactions? I mean, what did you perceive uh, in the reactions of, of your Russian friends uh, and, 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 and closer people to the reunification of Germany in 1990, um, yes, thinking about as, the past. Uh, well, as I um, point out in the book, I think the liberation of Eastern Europe passed almost to the applause of most Russian intellectuals because they had seen their own reform blocked by such things as the invasion of Czechoslovakia in, uh, in uh, 68 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the crackdown on solidarity that this tended to play into the Soviet system to block reform efforts there. So I think most Russian intellectuals were, were quite happy to see the East Europeans in effect liberated. Germany was different because Germany, you know, was a, divided Germany was a symbol of who won Second World War. So I think we recognized that that was going to be a dicey one uh, for Gorbachev to handle politically. I'll be honest that in December uh, 1989, I predicted that Gorbachev would not be able to agree to a united Germany in NATO. It was clear by December 89 you were going to have a united Germany. The only question then was the terms. Uh, and I think by the end of December 89, even the Soviet leadership understood, which they had not understood in November, that Germany was going to unite. Uh, and so the biggest argument came over, number first of all, how it would happen. Uh, they wanted a negotiated solution which would uh, take maybe years with the GDR negotiating with the Federal Republic and gradually combining. By March when the CDU won in the GDR, it was clear this wasn't going to happen and it was going to happen by simply accession of the Lenda in the East to the Federal Republic Constitution. I would say symbolically the worst way from the Soviet point of view because they had no influence. But there remained the question of NATO membership, and that was the crucial one uh, from, from then on, along with what limits the Germans would place on themselves, particularly their military efforts, which became a big thing. Now, uh, I don't want to get too long about this, but it was very clear to us that we had to do what we could to reassure Gorbachev while at the same time insisting that Germany had to stay in NATO. So among other things, we began to change NATO's goals, and there was a whole series of changes at uh, the meeting in, in, uh, of the Council in the spring of 90, and uh, this was conveyed to Gorbachev. Also, he was, uh, Baker told him in, in a meeting in early February when we were talking about the issue, he said, I want you to think about this. What's in your interest? A Germany which is not anchored in NATO, free to do anything it wishes in the future, maybe even go nuclear in some future government or one which is anchored in NATO, with all that means. And he said, bear in mind, the only basis for American military presence in Europe is NATO. If Germany pulls out, there's no NATO. There's no American presence. Or do you want that? Or do you want NATO preserved, Germany anchored in it, with all of the limitations that means for the future in what Germany can do and how it will act in Europe? And he added, ironically today, uh, looking at policies today, assuming, of course, there will be no movement of NATO jurisdiction to the east. And Gorbachev answered, he said, these are important points. Obviously, any movement of NATO to the east is unacceptable. But the other points that you made are important ones. You didn't ask for an immediate answer. I'm going to think about it. We came out of the meeting, and he turned to me, and he said, uh, how do you react? And I said, he's bought the argument, but he's got to have a little time. Uh, and so by February, it was even clear that I think from his reaction, he didn't say this doesn't make sense and, or any of that. 
he clearly understood uh, the point uh, that they were better off with Germany. And so then he, uh, the trick was to, uh, to, to achieve this really with the others. And he did that by negotiating with coal to get limits on the Bundeswehr, okay. to get okay. large payments. And then he waited until after the party congress where he was criticized in the party for the movements in Germany and the unification. He was also criticized by all of his German specialists, the Fallins, the Kvitsinskis, and so on. But he decided he had to make the deal, and as soon as the party congress was over, of course, he made his, his final deal with Kohl, uh, and uh, by the end of the summer, <coughs> it was all signed and sealed. Uh, <coughs> I, don't, I think the average person wasn't paying that much attention, even to Germany, because by this time, the, the economy was really uh, nosediving, and there were shortages, and people were worried about other things. But he could also say, we got a lot out of this. Uh, and at that point, Soviet troops hadn't begun to come home without housing and so on. But the Germans paid, what, 13 billion or so in various types of, uh, of payments, which was not insignificant to him at that time. And he got a limit on the Bundeswehr. And he got changes in NATO doctrine. He thought he had an understanding that NATO wouldn't take in extra members. Uh, but um, that didn't hold after the end of the Bush administration, unfortunately. So continuing along the same lines, <coughs> talking to, uh, I never met Gorbachev and I talked to him, but I talked to a number of his assistants and I read everything is available. It seems that in 1990 and 91, Gorbachev was hoping for much more financial and economic help, aid from Big Seven and the U.S. specifically. You know, once uh, Big Seven were meeting in London, he went there telling, again, according to his uh, assistants, telling them that uh, he's going to be bringing back between 15 and $25 billion from London, and he got nothing. He got quite frustrated, and the feeling in his entourage was that the West somehow was drawing, or at least not prepared, to honor commitments which were made three years earlier. Well, I think they were wrong about, there weren't any commitments, none that I know of, except very general ones. I mean, uh, uh, judging by um, Chernyayev's memoirs, for example, Cole was Sorry. telling him, you know, we're going to back you 100%, meaning politically, meaning we're not going to deal with Yeltsin. That was the import. And certainly Bush was telling him, we're all for perestroika, you have our political support. We never really promised him any economic support, though. And he mishandled the whole thing with the G7 terribly. First of all, we signaled very clearly that we really thought if we were going to be relevant, they had to move more or less in the direction that Yavlinsky was recommending. Yavlinsky actually came you know, to Cambridge and worked with Graham Allison and others on a plan. And uh, then he went down and briefed the president. And they, in effect, sent word, this sounds reasonable to us. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Primakov, the current foreign minister, and others, uh, one of the deputy prime ministers, had come along, in effect, to say, well, this is just one of many proposals. And what they came up with was a mishmash that was totally meaningless. There wasn't anything to support there. And, uh, and we were trying to convey this. I told him myself a couple of times, you know, what Pav uh, Pavlov, the prime minister, is doing doesn't have confidence in, you know, anywhere. And uh, he said, look, you know, if you are expecting assistance, you've got to give us some basis because we all understand the problem is the structure. And until you start changing the structure, pouring money in it is going to be like, you know, uh, dumping water on sand. Uh, and that uh, it's not priming a pump because you don't have a pump yet. And, I, you know, I said, you know, be realistic. And, we, we, and, and uh, I told him that. I'm sure others had. Instead, he let the bureaucrats, in effect, take over this process and come up with a nothing plan. And by the time he did finally wangle and get himself invited to uh, the G7, and we had given him every, uh, no reason whatsoever to expect concrete support. But for some reason, he seemed to have it in his mind because the analogy he was using then, he said, look, you know, you guys spent $100 billion on the Gulf War. Surely, you know, you can find that much to eliminate the threat of the Soviet Union, which has cost you hundreds of billions every year for a long time. 
Well, you know, the logic may have been impeccable, except that it wasn't politically feasible, <laughs> given budgetary problems elsewhere, particularly if, since nobody could figure out how this money really was going to help him. So it was never really you know, entertained seriously. Uh, if he had come up with a joint plan, and as I mentioned before, if we had maybe in the fall of the year before been willing to set up some sort of international organization devoted to the problems of transition to help them uh, along the way and share our experience, maybe by you know, the middle of 91 people would have been willing to pony up some money. Margaret Thatcher was arguing for it. She came in a private visit after she was prime minister and she sent word to Bush, you know, we've really got to help Misha. I mean, uh, she, uh, but she, they put it in very personal terms. Uh, but, uh, but the idea being exactly what he said, uh, think of how much money we've spent on the Cold War, he's ending it, we've got to help him pull through. Uh, but I, I think when an election was coming up the next year, Bush had budgetary problems, he was already accused of raising taxes when he shouldn't have, and for him it was sort of anathema to start talking about aid to the Soviet Union. Um, but it, a lot of it was Gorbachev's fault. And I think that there was a real matter of miscommunication in 91 on this whole issue. But I don't, I don't think it's fair to say we ever gave him any promises, because we really didn't. Uh, did he consult you, Gorbachev, that is, consult you or uh, complain to you, uh, say, before or after the London meeting, that you guys have promised and you're not delivering? No, he never put it that way. Uh, the only uh, one of the times he did complain once, uh, a little earlier, when he had asked for one, one and a half billion in credits for agriculture, and Bush delayed approving it because uh, the law required him to establish a credit worthiness. And by that time, the Soviet Union was so indebted, uh, you had to wonder. Uh, and we had asked him for information, which Gorbachev didn't want to give. He considered it a personal affront to question his credit worthiness, saying we've always paid these debts on, on uh, and, and I, on one of my meetings with him, I said, look, I'll, I'll convey to the president what you say, but Mr. President, you don't need three-year credits. This is short term, very short term, uh, that what you got to do is reform your whole distribution system. And I had recalled that he had told us some years before, I think it was just after he became General Secretary, I had met with him uh, with, uh, with Commerce Secretary Baldridge, and he had pointed out their problem was not so much production, but the fact that so much got wasted. I said, you know, you still haven't solved that. You know that's your problem. And, and, and getting three-year credits when you need so much capital for other things, to me, is not wise. And I, I, I said, you know, I'm not an economist, but it just seems to me you need to put pressure on the people who distribute your agricultural products to do it more efficiently, and you're not going to do it if you just keep, you know, buying the foreign grain and uh, uh, to fill the gap. And he just said, well, we've got an immediate thing. I've told George this is the way he can help me. If he doesn't want to, that's his business. Well, I went back and said, look, he's making it a matter of personal uh, commitment, and I guess we have to do it. Uh, so the president finally approved it. Uh, I, had, I had told him at one point, um, that nobody had confidence in Pavlov's plans, and any, implying that he shouldn't go to London with it. Uh, and, and, and I got feedback later that at a cabinet meeting, he had actually said, you know, it pointed to Pavlov and said, uh, you know, uh, no, everybody tells me that these are not going to work. Even the American ambassador says it's no good, which of course got back to me. I had trouble getting appointments with Pavlov after that. But in any event, uh, you know, we were trying to tell him. On the other hand, he didn't sit down and say, Jack, what's wrong with our plans? I mean, obviously, and I c couldn't have, uh, have assumed that, uh, that role in any event. But we did try to signify that of all the people working on it, we, we had more confidence in a guy like Yavlinsky than we did in the people in the government uh, with Pavlov. And frankly, we couldn't understand why he would name such a weak prime minister. I mean, when he had a chance after Rizhkov's heart attack to put somebody strong in the job, uh, uh, that was a, it was a puzzle, and since then I think it became clear, talking to people like Chernyayev, it was precisely the fact that Pavlov was weak was one of the reasons he named him, because he tended to see strong people as possible threats. And this was one of Gorbachev's weaknesses. But, you know, Gorbachev never really understood the economics of the thing. He knew things were wrong, but he still was, uh, you know, was emotionally committed to a socialist-type solution, and he didn't understand how markets work. And, uh, and he was constantly being you know, frightened by people in the government who said, you know, if you liberate this or if you do that, 
all hell's going to break loose. Everything is going to collapse. And uh, so he, he backed off every time he got to the, to the brink of, of, of doing something fairly radical. And I think that was the tragedy. But it definitely left us, you know, I would say with very few alternatives because if he didn't have a plan that was apt to work, uh, there was certainly no way we could go around and, and, and raise several tens of billions of dollars for him. Yeah, I'd like to, to ask a question about international politics. Uh, did uh, Gorbachev have a uh, Far Eastern, especially Chinese, uh, foreign politics? And what were the, uh, the consequences, the internal consequences of the, the Tiananmen crackdown in, in 1989 on, in, in, in Russia itself, as well, you perceive it? First of all, he did have a China policy. He, uh, they, you know, he, he wanted to cool things in Asia, just as he wanted to end the Cold War uh, in Europe. And he wanted to normalize relations with China, and he wanted to open up trade. Um, I think that being there during the Tiananmen uh, demonstrations did indicate to him some of the dangers, you know, of, of reform and some of the problems you could have. I don't, he, I think, did not approve the Chinese crackdown. On the other hand, he was not in favor of strong public statements against it because he felt that uh, uh, the normalization with China was so recent and so fragile. Uh, that he didn't want to go back to polemics with China. And in fact, his whole policy was based on, you know, creating friends around the borders rather than, uh, than enemies. So uh, it was definitely part of his policy to, and in effect, they met the Chinese terms. You know, the Chinese had three big demands. One, get out of Afghanistan. The second, uh, you know, thin the troops on the border. And, and, uh, and so on, they did all of those things. So in effect, they had met the, the, uh, the Chinese demands. Uh, um, so that uh, uh, I think it is tr he did have a China policy. I think toward Japan, you didn't ask about Japan, but I think clearly he had in mind uh, settling that within, I would say, by 92 or 93, he needed a few stages the matter of the Northern Territories. Uh, Chernyayev and others have told me that. He said, you know, if the Soviet Union hadn't collapsed, by 93 certainly we would have had that settled. But, uh, once the Soviet Union broke up, uh, you know, uh, it, I think Yeltsin and the Russian government could no longer give up any more territory because they were already being accused of, you know, of losing the whole empire. So it became politically more difficult. But he, he had a Far Eastern policy, although he spent, of course, a lot more time with, uh, with his Western interlocutors. Uh, and I think he was also hoping for much more in the way of Japanese assistance than came forward. And that's why he, was, he recognized that he would have to settle that territorial issue if he was going to get as much economic involvement as he wanted uh, from the Japanese. Yeah, you, you, pre you said previously that you were uh, in Khabarovsk at some point in the, in the, in the yes. Russian Far East. So was this tourism or was this uh, sort of a... No, uh, it was, region? well, a little of both. You yeah. always, uh, at new places, look around. But no, I, I would call on the senior officials and, and uh, talk to, to various people. After 89, when they had election, we would always meet with the opposition. Uh, and um, uh, I would usually meet the party secretary and the regional officials. And uh, uh, in the case of Khabarovsk, I called on um, General Novozhilov, the Far East military commander, uh, and so on. So it was, uh, uh, I would say it was an official trip, though there are always some t aspects of tourism. They'll show you the lo local, you know, uh, monuments and things uh, as part of it. Jack, a, uh, a crucial question. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've just been debating this in my, my classes. You know, one can go through your book and pick up a number of references such as socialism or socialist system was doomed from the very beginning. Um, uh, but it's sort of interspersed throughout the book. You don't have a section or you don't summarize it in a sense. Uh, is your opinion that the Soviet system was really never a viable one, would have collapsed under the weight of inefficiencies, even if Romanov would be in, in uh, uh, became the Secretary General, or Shevardnadze, or uh, uh, was it the poorly designed perestroika, or was it a dying system? I think it was a, a dying system, uh, but. I think it could have, the life could have been prolonged for decades with different policies. 
you know, in any faulty system, of course, the most dangerous period, as many people have recognized, is precisely to try to reform it. I mean, that idea goes back at least as far as Machiavelli, when I think he said the most dangerous thing any prince can do is to try to change the institutions uh, in the principality. Uh, and, and, the, and the least likely of success, the most dangerous and the least likely of success. So uh, I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, a reformer it, it always takes a great chance. Uh, but if you had had, if say Ligachev had won uh, the, uh, the uh, competition with Gorbachev in 87 or 89, we'd probably still have the Soviet Union. Uh, the Baltic states would be giving them a lot of trouble, but uh, uh, on the whole, I think you'd still have it. They would be, every year would be a rather, a little bit worse economic performance. Uh, people would be getting upset, uh, uh, and they would probably have been forced to end the Cold War uh, on the military side, because I think they could all see the need to get out of so much uh, uh, on the military. But I don't think that system, I think the, the basic, one of the basic inefficiencies was uh, of course, the central controls. You just simply cannot have an efficient system when it's bureaucratically based on central controls. That's first of all. But second, I think that uh, from a standpoint of, uh, of, you might say, political and social organization, I don't, you cannot have a civil society if power over the instruments of compulsion, that is the political instruments of police, the army, is in the same hands as total power over the economy. I think that, uh, I, I, and it seems to me that uh, you can't be efficient unless you have some separation of the two. Uh, and um, uh, therefore, I don't think that s system could have been perpetuated indefinitely, but I think it could have lasted another 40 or 50 years because if they had not started to undermine the power of the Communist Party, that was such a rigid and effective means of control uh, that if, if Gorbachev had not gone after the party, I think it could have held a dying Soviet Union together much longer. And of course, when you do it much longer, it means probably even more chaos when it breaks up. And I think the longer they hung on, the more they would run the risk of, say, a Yugoslav outcome. And uh, I, one of the reasons I credit Gorbachev and the others is they avoided that. The violence has been on the periphery, and though it's bad in those areas, most of it started before the Soviet Union collapsed. In the, the central states, Russia, Ukraine, you know, Belarus, it has happened. It happened quite peacefully, and that's something that would have been hard to predict, you know, on the basis of, of history. So that uh, I, uh, I do think that uh, um, that uh, the system was doomed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the way it went out uh, was terribly important to to people, and uh, this was probably as benign and. Uh, 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 a way as, uh, as an empire could collapse when you look at the collapse of other empires. Most of them have involved more violence and even more disruption. But is, is your, uh, just to follow up on what you just said, is, uh, is your analysis uh, in a way based on the Chinese example uh, where you have, I mean, a reform, uh, quite, quite effective reform, and still a, a very centralized I'm control. cognizant. It's not based on the Chinese. I'm cognizant of what happened in China, and I don't profess to be a specialist on it. But it does seem to me that, the, that Gorbachev did not have the option of following the Chinese route. First of all, you know, uh, the communist system had been in China for a much shorter period. It was less entrenched. The Cultural Revolution had destroyed many of the cadres, particularly in the countryside. The whole Chinese tradition they were closer to, you might say, private farming and, 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 and you might say, peasant self-reliance uh, than the Soviet collective farm system had been there since the early 30s. You had a very entrenched bureaucracy, one that hasn't been actually broken yet. Uh, he could not have started with agriculture. He could not have liberated agriculture uh, with the Communist Party in control the way it was. Uh, I think Gorbachev really had no option but to start with the political reforms. We still don't know, of course, what the final outcome in China is going to be. In a sense, Russia may be over the most painful part of their political transition, and even much of the painful parts of the economic transition. Uh, China may still have that to come. I, you know, I don't know, uh, but um, you know, we will see. But whatever uh, you know, the comparison teaches us, I don't believe Russia had the option, or the Soviet Union had the option, of following uh, you know, the Chinese route. That is, of liberalizing the economy while keeping a lid on politically. I don't think they could have done it because 
uh, because the system was simply too rigid and it combined control of the economy and control of other things and you couldn't just split off control of the economy and leave the party intact in other respects. I mean, you could pass decrees, but it just wasn't going to happen. In terms of the disintegration of the larger empire, I was wondering what prompted Gorbachev to announce that the USSR will not intervene militarily to support the Polish regime or the Czech regime. I mean, everybody, the conservatives, the military in the Soviet Union, blamed that this is the moment the empire started to disintegrate. Uh, why did he do so? Well, a variety of things. I think most fundamentally, he by that time was convinced that they should not and could not, in the indefinite future, hold the empire together by force. That this just wasn't going to work. Uh, he had to reduce his military force and not use it. And I think that they had learned in Afghanistan that you can get bogged down and you don't achieve anything. I think he was willing to run the risk because initially he thought he would get a group of Dupchiks, a reformed communist like himself, who could keep themselves in power because the people had, by that time, come to accept socialism, as, as he defined it, in a broad sense. And if you put a human face on it, it would be attractive. Well, they lost that opportunity in 68, if there had ever been that opportunity when they intervened in Czechoslovakia. And I think those of us who knew Eastern Europe, I, I was also ambassador to Czechoslovakia, were quite aware that once it's clear to the people there that Soviet tanks will not intervene, that the communist regimes are doomed because they were already extremely unpopular and were viewed as simply being kept in place by the Russians. He honestly didn't understand that. Later, Bismertnik told me privately, uh, what, what he, was prime, he was foreign minister then, uh, this was an early, uh, 91, and after all this had happened, he said, you know, you can't believe how misinformed we were. He said, you know, we had sent out not professional diplomats to these countries, but usually party officials that we wanted out of the way. And they dealt only with the guys at the top. And any time we got reports, say, from the Western press about, say, problems in East Germany or in Hungary or wherever, and we would inquire, the ambassador would come back, well, I talked to Husak or I talked to Honecker. He says everything is fine. This is just imperialist propaganda. And he said, you know, the, these guys, many of them, most of them didn't know the languages. They didn't know what was going on in the country, and they just dealt with the people we'd put in there. So he said, frankly, we were surprised. We did not anticipate the depth of feeling. But I'll hand it to Gorbachev. I'm no longer quoting Besmertnik. Once it was happening, he was as good as his word. He said at the UN in December 88, that the freedom of choice knows no limitation. And I wrote in my, I kept a little journal uh, many days, and I wrote, does he re really know what he's saying? East Europe will go if this is true. Will he accept it? But also the Baltic will go. And what's he going to do then? And, uh, and in effect, at that point, he showed that he drew the line at what he claimed was the Soviet border. He would let East Europe go. Uh, but he obviously, it was much more difficult to let the Baltic states go. But so summarize, number one, I think there was a genuine conviction that he had to do his foreign policy on a different basis and on the basis of consent. But at the same time, he did not anticipate that the outcome would be so unfavorable as it turned out to be. What I was saying is that he didn't have to say this. You know, when you're pointing a gun at somebody, you know, you don't have to tell them that there are no bullets in the gun. Uh, well, he stopped I, pointing the gun. Uh, yeah, at, at least that's <laughs> what the the military, the communist nationalists are saying. That well, they're saying it. I think it's wrong, and I think that I actually Gorbachev let Shevardnadze do most of the defense of this policy, and I thought Shevardnadze answered it eloquently at the party congress in uh, was it June '90, when he was attacked for this, and uh, it was who lost Eastern Europe. And you recall, it was a wonderful statement by Shevardnadze. He said, I'll tell you who lost Eastern Europe. Those that ordered our troops into Hungary in 1956. Those that ordered us to smash the Prague Spring in 68. Those that pressured the Poles to establish martial law. And yes, do you think the world applauded when we invaded Afghanistan? He said, those people lost Eastern Europe. Don't blame us. And, uh, you know, I, 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 again, when I read that, again, I noted I never thought I would hear a Soviet foreign minister make such a statement. And yet it was basically true. You know, if, and if, you know, if Russia doesn't 
use it properly now, it's their problem. But in effect, they created the possibility of creating friendly states on their borders. Uh, and I think, you know, Gorbachev, they had looked at the rest of the world and they understood that, you know, the U.S. is secure not only because it's across the ocean, but it has friendly states on both borders, you know, and we maintain a good relationship with Canada because we don't try to dominate them and we don't station troops there and we don't intervene and try to select their leaders. And I must say, they, they were bright enough to understand some of these things. And they understood history and they also understood their own political problems. But, uh, I, but I think the critics are absolutely wrong because I think Eastern Europe was a, not an asset to them. And I think people who look at it that way uh, simply misunderstood the, uh, the, uh, the situation. I used to tell our NATO people, and they would half agree with me. I said, you know, <laughs> there's no way the Soviets are going to invade Western Europe. I mean, entirely aside from NATO, because you know, what are they going to do with Czech and Polish <laughs> and Hungarian troops? Are they going to put them in front, in which case they'll probably defect? Are they going to put them behind, in which case they're a security thing? How are they going to use them? And I know one of our NATO commanders said, Jack, you know, that must be a nightmare for every Warsaw-backed commander. And perhaps we, shouldn't, we should think more about that. But it was true. I mean, how can you have a real you know, ally who helps you protect them when they hate you and when they feel that you're dominating them? And they weren't. So the, these countries were a real liability and an increasing liability to the Soviet Union. And I think this was something that Gorbachev was capable of seeing and his critics I think they are, are just being, well, they're either playing politics or they're being stupid about it. I think we're running out of time, so we have to finish. Uh, Ambassador Matlock, thank you so much. I hope we see you again on our campus. I mean, we've asked a lot of questions, but there are more oh. to, to ask. <laughs> and fault. in fact, we still need more access to documents, more access to, uh, to archives. But thank you so much. You're very helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.